With the first pick in the 2019 NBA Draft, the New Orleans Pelicans select Zion Williamson from Duke Pinagadala. Up for the last! Oh, blocked by James! They do have a timeout. Decide not to use it. Curry, way down to How's it going, everyone? Welcome back to the Shot Clock Podcast. My name is Nathan Shaw. I'm your host, as always. Today, I'm joined by Trevor Lane, senior writer for Lakers Nation. Trevor, man, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me. Trevor, you've been writing for Lakers Nation for how long now? Uh, gosh, you know, I actually just hit my five-year anniversary. I didn't even realize it, but uh, I saw it on LinkedIn the other day. Apparently, I've been there five years, so it, it flew by. For you being along with something like that for so long, and obviously you're a big Lakers fan. I mean, look at your whole background. You've got a Kobe post to this side, <laughs> right. a Kobe book behind you, a couple others behind you. But it's just you've been there for so long, kind of. Has there ever been a point where you're kind of like, what what kind of made you realize that you love that job? So um, my initial job, actually, that I started out towards coming out of college was was teaching. And that was something that I got into. But I always knew that I was going to want to do something else on the on the side, some sort of supplemental income. And, and the first thing I turned to was writing because that was always a, a love of mine. And so I started initially trying to write one novel and then kind of soured on that idea and then tried writing another one. And the problem that I kept running into is that while I'm sitting there trying to write and coming up with all these characters and ideas and plots and all kinds of stuff, my attention kept getting distracted by Lakers rumors. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going about this all wrong. I need to write what I love and what I'm spending all my time on anyway. And that's and that's Lakers basketball, the earliest memory that I have is of the Los Angeles Lakers, watching a Laker game when I was a kid. So this is the team that I grew up around. This is the team I was spending all my time on. And so I said, you know what, I'm doing this wrong. And so I started up my own blog and started writing there just to kind of get my feet wet and see if I could do it and find my voice, that sort of thing. And uh, from there, once I I realized that, yeah, this is a consistent thing that I can do, I can stick with it, I can can try to make something of this. Uh, I got picked up by one site and and worked there for uh, five, six months. And my work caught the attention of Lakers Nation, and they brought me on. And my my role there has just grown and grown and grown over the years. And and now that's that's my full time job. I'm not even teaching anymore. So um, it, it's been a it's been a journey, but it, it's been a fun one. And now I I just feel incredibly fortunate to get to to cover the team that I grew up on. It's uh, it's amazing. So kind of you mentioned wanting to go into teaching originally. Mm-hmm. What kind of made you? I know it's off question about what you do now, but what kind of made you want to go into teaching? No, it's actually not an an off question at all because the two are very, very related. Um, And that's the one thing that I maybe wasn't uh, wasn't expecting going into this is how how many things are actually similar between teaching and what I'm doing now covering the Lakers because I was a I was a history teacher and what I always loved was telling some of the best stories from history and just telling about uh, things from the American Revolution and, and things like that, World War II and, and all these exciting points in our in our history. And I, I, I do that still now. Um, I, I still kind of scratch that itch of being able to tell stories. And of course, that links back to my initial thoughts to, to uh, being a writer. And so now I'm just telling basketball stories. It's the, it's the same thing. You know, we're breaking down the salary cap and breaking down uh, plays and X's and O's and all that kind of stuff. But we're also telling very human stories and very dramatic stories that are playing out on our televisions every night. So um, there, there's definitely some similarities between the two that allow me to kind of fulfill the things that I was initially attracted to with, with teaching. So how different would your life have been if you would have pursued your career path in teaching compared to what you're doing now? Oh, I actually did. I didn't stop teaching until a week ago. I, I literally just left teaching. I taught for 13 years and, uh, and I just left it to do Lakers full time. Um, so it is something that I did. And that means the first uh, I've been covering the Lakers now with Lakers nation, as I mentioned for five years. So that means that for the last, it's been probably about six years total. I've been doing two jobs at once uh, essentially. And so that was extremely difficult. That meant a lot of late nights that meant um, writing during my, my lunchtime that meant, you know, between classes, doing quick little podcasts and, th- and things like that. Uh, it certainly wasn't easy. And, uh, and I can tell you so far, I'm, 
about, well, about a week and a half into just full-time Lakers all the time and, uh, and being able to just focus on this. And so that's been, um, it's been a very cool transition. I'm, I'm definitely enjoying being able to just focus all my attention on uh, Lakers basketball. Did any of your students kind of come up to you and they're like, oh, hey, I know you. You're the, every time you got a new student, they're like, you're the Lakers nation writer. You're Trevor Lane. Yeah. So, um, so some of my students, most of my students didn't, didn't know, but then they found my, uh, my Twitter account and I kept the two things very separate. I didn't talk about teaching or it, I didn't, it wasn't, I, I kept the two things separate for, for years cause I didn't want it to be an issue or anything like that. Um, some of my students a few years ago found my Twitter account. And so they thought I must be some sort of celebrity or something like that. Cause you know, I mean like Jay-Z gets a blue check mark. So they saw a blue check mark and they go, Ooh, like that's, <laughs> that's exciting or something. But, um, but it hasn't been too big of an issue. I've had a few other staff members who recognize me or something, but for the most part, you know, the, the majority of kids aren't wanting to talk basketball or anything like that. A few do, and, and we would talk basketball back and forth, but for the most part, it really wasn't a, wasn't a problem or, a, or an issue at all. So let's go back to your early life when you first became a Lakers fan. What, what's your earliest memory of the Lakers? Uh, Showtime, Showtime, Magic and Kareem. Uh, watching the Showtime Lakers, it's the earliest memory that I have is of being in my liver, living room watching a Lakers game and trying to mimic Kareem's skyhook on my little little mini kids hoop. So I was probably, I don't know, maybe four or something like that. And, uh, and so that's the earliest memory that I, that I have is watching those Showtime Lakers. And, and it was always something that I did with my dad. I can remember uh, turning down the volume on the TV so that we could turn on the radio and hear the Chick Hearn broadcast because that was always so much better and so we would we would do that to watch the games um and so just over the years it was just kind of a a family thing my dad grew up as a Lakers fan so I was around it as a kid and and so I always loved the team Um, I remember when Magic Johnson returned for that brief you know half a season in 1996 putting uh getting all the newspapers I could find and putting them all over the walls of my of my bedroom so that uh, it it made like Magic Johnson wallpaper or something because I was so excited the magic was coming back. Um, yeah, it, it's something that I grew up with and something that I, that I've always loved. And so it's kind of cool to get to get to do this now and have this as a job when this is the, the team that I've been, been loving from as early as I can remember. What would you kind of, what team in like our recent eras? Cause I know last year, the Lakers with LeBron and Lonzo and all of them, they had the nickname at the beginning of the season as the Showtime Lakers, which was a homage to what they used to be. So what kind of team in our past areas would you compare the most to the Showtime Lakers? I mean, just in terms of, as far as Lakers teams go, just in terms of, of dominance, you've got, you know, the Shaq and Kobe Lakers of the early 2000s. Those were, those were some incredible teams, very different style of play com- compared to the Showtime squads. But uh, in terms of winning, that was, that was fantastic. Those were some incredible times. And then of course the, the Kobe Powell teams, um, those were great, but as far as play style, the team that that I've really that I really enjoyed, even though they were a rival to the Lakers, uh, was the Seven Seconds or Less Phoenix Suns, and the Suns kind of kind of embodied that Lakers style of of offense that we're going to get the ball out fast, we're going to go flying up the court. Of course, the court. Of course, they took it to levels that um, you know nobody at the time was doing, and, and they played at a faster pace then than than pretty much every other team in the league. Uh, today, which is crazy, t- by today's standard, the Suns would be one of the slower paced teams in today's NBA because so many teams have adopted their strategies now in the, the modern league. But so those are the teams that I look at as sort of contemporaries of that Showtime Lakers squad. You know, they the Suns embodied that fast breaking style. But in terms of, you know, bringing together Lakers fans, the Shaq Kobe teams and the Shaq Pow teams, I think, are always going to be, be beloved. But I don't know if it's ever going to hold a candle to what the Showtime teams meant just because of how much it it not only grew the Lakers fan base, but grew the NBA as a whole as a legitimate sports league in this country. You and I talked about a lot of teams growing off of the seven seconds or less Phoenix Suns uh, coaching system, which is, you're right, that's one thing they've adapted now, kind of flying up the court, trying to get that shot off. So what do you think – even like maybe not even just the Suns, what do you think kind of inspired that idea to want to be that next highlight on NBA on TNT? And that's why they're running so many of these plays and trying to get their shots off. 
Um, so why are teams flying up and down the floor like that? Well, it's it's an efficiency thing. Uh, Mike D'Antoni brought over a lot of the European style play, which is you're going to get into the paint and then kick out to, to shooters. And that's the way you're going to generate your offense. And it's all five guys working together, guys who can do a multitude of things. You don't have a guy, as many guys who are just, you know, I'm just a big man. I just play with my back to the basket, throw me the ball in the post and I'm going to go to work or, or I'm just a, a three point shooting specialist. You're seeing more and more guys that are multifaceted and that's as the game is kind of evolving. So he brought that style of play into NBA caliber talent. And that's definitely revolutionized the game. I mean, if you look at the playoff games that are happening right now, um, like say you look at a Houston Rockets team and the way they play, and you go back and you look at, say, the Shaq Kobe Lakers, right, 20 years ago, it, it barely looks like they're even playing the same sport just because the way the game has, is being played has changed so, so much. And again, that's a credit to, uh, to those Suns teams and as well as to advanced analytics that are becoming more and more of a thing as teams are figuring out what shots are efficient, what, what shots are not, and they're focusing on those things and kind of coming up with ways to, to create the best offense they possibly can. Yeah, I kind of want to uh, – we watch that a lot, these younger teams. That's why a lot of these younger prospects are getting better and getting higher draft is because that's kind of how they played in AAU is they're running the fast break and taking advantage of the fast-paced game, kicking out to the shooters. So many of them are gaining that three-point shot. Even the bigs are. But to kind of go on with that, I want to talk a little bit about the Phoenix Suns itself because we've already talked about them. They went 8-0 on the bubble before they mm -hmm. got eliminated from the playoffs. So let's say they keep that same pace up within the regular season. Do you think they would have been able to sustain that? I mean, I, I certainly don't think they, they're, they're not going to go undefeated in the regular season, right? So there's no, they can't continue that exact pace, but could they continue at this level of play? Uh, maybe. I mean, look, DeAndre Ayton is a very talented player. Devin Booker is obviously incredible. Um, it's unfortunate that they didn't make the playoffs. And I was one of the people that was saying, why are the Suns even here? There's no reason to to invite them. And then here they go and make me eat my words and they go eight and oh. I mean, it's an incredible run. And now for the Suns, you know, we were all questioning what what's the point of even inviting them to the bubble. Well, now the Suns go into their offseason with some momentum. You know, they've generated some positivity. So even though they've got to be disappointed to not lose and still not make the playoffs, I mean, that's that's unbelievable but they've generated some positive momentum going into the, going into the off season now for them. And so the question is going to be, what do they do from here? What pieces do they add? And are they now a bigger threat next season, which is actually going to be starting up before we know it, because everything is, is super condensed dealing with uh, the fallout of, of the league shutdown. Kind of, I want to talk about the not so incredible, uh, postseason that's been so far beyond with the Lakers. And I kind of even put the bucks in this, circumstance i mean they lost to the magic just last game currently playing in about an hour from now but them and the lakers kind of were those teams that struggled are you worried at all about the lakers run this first round uh yeah i mean look so we, when we knew that the plan was okay we're gonna we're gonna restart things and it's gonna be in a bubble and there's gonna be no fans and this is all taking place in Florida and families are going to be with players and, and everything. That's not like, it's something you have to do in order to get the season going. And I'm hundred percent behind that. But for a team like the Lakers, for a team like the Bucks, you're in first place, you're rolling, you're beating teams. But the bottom line is that what you don't want to see is a change to the status quo because everything is going well for you. You don't want to see things get shaken up. Whereas if you're one of the mid tier teams, or if you're a bottom tier team, you want things to get to get mixed up because maybe that I, the dynamics change and allow you to jump up. And that's what we're seeing play out. We're seeing some teams play perform better in the bubble and other teams not. And we've seen some surprises so far. The Lakers offense has not looked good. They haven't been able to regain their rhythm that they had before we went into uh, before we went into the break. And, and so that's been an issue for them and certainly cause for concern. LeBron has mentioned a few times that it's, it's an adjustment getting used to not playing in front of fans and that it is, it is bothering him. So uh, you have to be a little bit worried. You're certainly more worried now than you were when things had just shut down and the Lakers had just beat the bucks and the Clippers. You're feeling pretty good at that point. And so now you've got to be a bit concerned about whether or not this team can regain their footing. I still think there's a ton of talent there and they certainly have every opportunity to do it, but, 
until they get out there and they start beating teams and they start making some of the shots that they've been missing, uh, we're all just going to be kind of waiting and watching and, and hoping that they're able to figure things out. Yeah, I remember coming off that Sunday night game of March 8th, which is crazy to believe that that was five months ago now. But I remember coming off that win, excited with it being the first win of the season against the Clippers. And especially since their roster was more depth, with picking up Reggie Jackson, picking up uh, Marcus Morris and all of them. And then we picked up Markeith. Markeith had himself a solid game. And I remember the confidence feeling skyrocketed, especially with that win against the Bucks. But then, you know, we're going to pretend the loss against the uh, Nets didn't happen. But then you go into the right. suspension, and it worried me. I was kind of like, okay, well, you've got a 35-year-old LeBron already kind of showing off a little sluggishness, trying to play it slower, get himself prepared. Now he has five months off, no basketball, to kind of get himself in somewhat game shape while he's still keeping it sluggish. So it just kind of worried me a little bit there because you know that he's not going to come in the strongest, which he didn't even heading into this regular season. He had like an 18-point game, first game of the season against the Clippers. Then he comes in, has about like a 17-point game in the first bubble game against the Clippers. So it's that sluggishness whenever he restarts that kind of worries me. And yeah, he had the triple-double last night, but... The aggressiveness is what's really worrying me. He showed a few signs of it, though, within the second half or second quarter. But LeBron's aggressiveness, how key do you think that is to this team? I think it's very key. And, you know, he keeps popping up on the injury report. We're seeing that he has a lingering groin issue. So maybe that's part of the problem. But, you know, you look at LeBron's game and he had what? Uh, I think it was 17 rebounds and 16 assists and and 23 or so points off the top of my head. So he was, if you look at his stat line, it's it's just a, a massive performance that he had in game one against the, the Blazers. And, but as you're watching the game, you're going, well, why isn't LeBron just taking over? Why isn't he, you know, dunking on everybody every single play? Because that's, that's where he has set the bar for himself just by being so great for so many years. Uh, people expect him just to take over every single game. I do think in game two, he's going to be, he's going to have to be more aggressive if his teammates aren't hitting shots, because one of the things that we have to understand about LeBron is that he's not wired like Kobe. He's not wired like Michael Jordan in terms of just his basketball DNA, who he is as a player. He's not somebody who necessarily wants to score all the points. He is more wired. Uh, it, it's a bit closer to say a magic Johnson who wants to be feeding his teammates, wants to be hitting them for open looks. And that's, that's what he does probably as his default setting. He can take the ball and score, and we've seen him do that. We've seen him, what, in the playoffs, scored 25 straight points for the for the Cavs. Um, so he can certainly do that, but it's not his ideal. So if the Blazers and if his other Lakers teammates force him to be more aggressive scoring because they are not hitting their open looks, then, then we'll see that. But um, you know what? For the Lakers right now, given their struggle shooting, I think it's already going to be a must. I think he's going to have to start really trying to take over himself and score the basketball. So rather than get 16 assists, maybe he's going to have to put up 35 points. I will say kind of going back to our showtime topic that we talked about earlier, teams that kind of compare to him, this current Lakers team is with LeBron and AD running. It reminds me of a Kareem and Magic type duo. But so far with the struggles, it's not kind of living up to that expectation of what it could be or what it should be. But LeBron's passing has been so key to this offense. And like you said, the shooting hasn't, the shots haven't been falling. And Danny Green's been struggling. That first game against the Raptors, he went like 0 7. It's just, mm -hmm. they've been off and on, which I said in a past episode reminds me a lot of our December struggle. Lost four games in a row. Shooting's really poor. KCP's trying to find his groove. Kuzma's playing inconsistent, but kind of hits the big shots. And it's a lot like what we're having now is that December struggle. So unless they kick it back in, it's going to live on for a lot longer, and especially they're going up against a team like the Blazers where Damian Lillard could easily drop 30 a night um, on you any given night he has. It's 30 points, like seven assists, and C.J. McCollum, also another guy that could drop you 30. And then they have such an incredible rim, protect, rim protection with uh, Nurkic and Whiteside, in my opinion, and but the wings are weak and that's what they've got to take advantage of is LeBron play him at the wing try to get him to kind of go in drive in from the baseline and or even swing it out to your guys on the wing it's a lot of things that the rotations even have to figure out like Dion Waiters barely got any minutes which I know that was a thing you had a problem with so can you kind of go off of that 
Uh, yeah. So, so waiters, when he came in, the thought was that he could be that scoring threat off the bench that we've been clamoring for this all season long, that they need somebody who can create their own shot and preferably somebody who can put the ball on the ground and attack the basket off the, off the dribble. Um, the Lakers on the, for the season ranked dead last in drives per game. They just, they just don't have, they've got mostly spot up shooters, which is what they focused on getting. And unfortunately those spot up shooters haven't been hitting their shots so far in the bubble, but that was the, the archetype that they were looking for was the three and D type of player. So you bring in a Dion waiters and he can do those things that you didn't have. He can attack the rim. Um, he can create shots for himself in a pinch. If there's four seconds left on the clock, you can give him the ball and he can get off a look and he can make some time. Like he can take some bad shots, but he can also make bad shots for you. And that's a skill in and of itself. We're seeing a number of guys who are building careers around that. Like Lou Williams has done it. Jordan Clarkson is in the process of doing that kind of being that off the bench scorer. So Dion waiters can definitely fill a role that the Lakers need. I think the reason why he didn't play much in game one was the defense. What we've seen pretty consistently from him is that when he is on the floor defensively, he can get lost. And that's a lot of that I would attribute to him being new to the team and not understanding the rotations just yet. It takes time to get that to where you're on a string with all the rest of the guys. And so if you're Frank Vogel and you're trying to defend Damian Lillard and CJ McCollum, and you know that if one guy is even half a step off, that's probably a basket coming for the Blazers, whether it's from Lillard or he's creating, creating for someone else, uh, that, I, that would make me hesitate a little bit too to put waiters in. But given how stagnant the Lakers offense looked, I would be putting waiters in at the very least whenever LeBron James isn't on the floor just to have somebody who can create something out of nothing in case things do bog down because that has been an issue over the entire season for the Lakers. One guy kind of have like, it's so weird the confidence I have in him, especially remember watching the uh, finals and seeing his mistake in game one against the Warriors back in 2018. I weirdly have confidence in JR. And I feel like he's one of those other guys that you know, they added in for shot creation, shooting, a guy that could play off LeBron and AD well enough where they can kick it out to him if needed. But he hasn't been getting much minutes either. He got a lot of minutes when AD and LeBron were both out in the, I believe it was the Thunder preseason game mm -hmm. or something along the lines of that. But what, what do you think JR adds to this team in your own perspective? Well, ideally what JR Smith gives you is, is outside shooting, but you don't really know what you're going to get for him. I mean, people say, oh, he replaced Avery Bradley, and that's not really correct. They're not filling the same role at all. He may have taken that roster spot, but ideally J.R. Smith was going to come in and be a shooter for them, be somebody that you can kick the ball out to and can knock in shots from deep. And right now you can say they definitely need that. The question is, does J.R. Smith provide enough in floor spacing and, and shot making ability that he negates whatever he would give up on the defensive end, because this isn't J.R. Smith that we saw six years ago, who was a solid three and D wing defender, one of the better ones in the entire NBA. Um, he's not the same guy. He's older at this point. He hasn't played in the NBA in a while. And so it's going to take him time to ramp up. I do think that because of the experience that he's got, he's probably a guy where if you really need shooters on the floor, you could throw him out there on an offensive possession. But I think ultimately the defensive lapses will probably catch up with you. Whereas Waiters, I think, has been a little bit dy more dynamic as a scorer. So I think that he's somebody that can perhaps mitigate the defensive issues um, that he would have on the other end. So I understand why, why J.R. Smith isn't getting a lot of minutes. But but trust me, you are not the only one. I have tons of people that have been hitting me up on Twitter saying, saying J.R. Smith is the answer. Put him in. People are saying, start J.R. Smith. He's going he's gonna to be what solves the Lakers shooting problems. Um, I'll believe it when I see it, but if they do put him in there, I hope he just lights it up for the Lakers because that would that would be a great story, that kind of uh, redemption for J.R. Smith. We've already got a Dwight Howard redemption yeah. story this year, so why not a J.R. Smith one too? Yeah, the J.R. Smith one would be incredible. See, uh, it'd be a nice way to make up for uh, his 2018 mm -hmm. season with the Cavs. But yeah, it's like J.R. JR is such a – we've always known him to be a flashy guy. He could pull up from deep if he wanted to. He could – make any shot, you're watching his workout videos before he gets signed by a team, you're like, man, someone needs to sign this guy. I want to see him back in the league. Same thing with uh, Nick Young. He's one guy that I'd love to see in the league again. Maybe not with a big role or not even like a rotational role, but some guy that you see on the bench that gets about three minutes in a game at the end whenever they're in a blowout. But I'd love to see a guy like JR get some more minutes, not starting-wise like some fans might believe, but 
he would be a great guy, especially off the bench. That's one thing we need, especially, is the shot creation. You get Kuzma in. Kuzma creates some shots, but he's inconsistent. He, I mean, heck, he'll hit the baseline fade if he really – If sometimes we'll get lucky and we could see that. Like the other day he had that against the – Blazers, it was about his like first two minutes in the game. Hits that baseline fade. You're like, oh, man, I'm loving this guy already. Loving seeing him get some minutes this game. And then he goes inconsistent a little bit, then gets hot on the second half. But, yeah, kind of talking about Kuzma, where do you see his growth? Because, yes, his growth has gone down a significantly amount since the AD signing or since the AD trade. Where do you believe it goes on from here? Um, so Kyle Kuzma is a guy that I've actually been really happy with in the bubble because, as you mentioned, the in- inconsistency has been a problem with him all season. We would see him uh, blow up against the Thunder, say, on the road, drop, uh, like I think it was 34 points, yeah, about something 30. like that. And then the next night, he'll put up four. And it's that kind of roller coaster effect that had fans just losing their minds about Kyle Kuzma all, all season long. I do a post game show and we do direct interaction with fans. And let me tell you, Kyle Kuzma has a good game. Everybody's singing his praises. The very next night, people are saying he's terrible and you need to trade him and get him out and all, all of this stuff because he was a roller coaster all season. You just couldn't count on consistent production. But I think he's been more consistent in the bubble. We've seen. Uh, His shot has been, uh, it's looked more comfortable for him. I think defensively, he has made some real strides. He's gotten better. He's still not a great defender, but I think he's at at the least average at this point. And I'm seeing him make some good plays on the floor. In fact, I think he's been one of the better Lakers in the bubble so far. Um, He only shot five of 14 against, uh, against the Blazers, but he was one of the few guys that was creating things and getting things going to the basket and finishing, especially in that fourth quarter. Yeah. In fact, I think that there's a decent chance if you let Kuzma and Caruso continue to play and not pull them out part of the way through the fourth quarter, the Lakers may have just beat the Blazers in, in game one. They were rolling. So I've been pretty happy with Kuzma overall. I think that he's been doing a, a good job uh, of being more consistent in Orlando. Now, hopefully that's something that will continue moving forward because he's got plenty of talent. Just the question is, can he do it on a night-in, night-out basis? And that's where he needs to go next. Yeah, I mean, we saw it his rookie season, his sophomore Mm -hmm. year season, even the, what's he in, his third year, fourth year now? Mm -hmm. Anyways, the year with LeBron, it was, he played well as that second option. You saw him, it was like, this guy might fit great along LeBron. Ingram, not so much, because Ingram's a guy that kind of needs the ball to create his shot. He's the guy that post-ups on you, hit the fadeaway. But Kuzma was the guy that you could easily play off of and knew how to play well off of LeBron and Lonzo. And he lost Lonzo, which they were arguably best friends whenever they played together and kind of weakened himself in the game. And you could tell kind of emotionally it kind of was – you could tell there was something off with the roster at first with Kuzma. He seemed like unfitting. The whole team seemed to bond it a lot better than Kuzma did with him. As the season went on, they bonded so much better. But it's – it is – Kuzma does have tremendous talent. He could be anywhere. I, you put him on a team like let's say we did end up trading him for the Derrick Rose. You package him in for Derrick Rose. He would play great on that team. They have Blake Griffin out. It's just a solid. Either you play him at the three or four. Yeah. So so with Kyle Kuzma, you know, you picked up on on him not really fitting in with the team at the beginning of the season, and there's and there's a reason for that. So that's a great observation. Um, he this was from uh, from Jared Dudley who said at the beginning of the season, every single Laker knew exactly what their role was, except for Kyle Kuzma. And that's why he was kind of, I don't want to say he was the outcast, but he was the guy who stuck out as nobody knew exactly what he should be doing. Everybody else on the team, all these veterans knew exactly what their role was. And that's why they were able to hit the ground running and get going so quickly. We, we expected it was going to take time for them to develop chemistry and and all that with so many new faces. Uh, but Kuzma was the one guy who struggled a little bit. Not only did he miss most of training camp due to injury, um, but he was also the guy where they didn't really know what he can be because you've got his play here, his ceiling is way up here, and you don't know where he's going to fall in there. So Jared Dudley said, said that, look, we know, right, for, for example, KCP is going to be a 3 and D player. Danny Green is going to be a 3 and D player. But Kyle Kuzma's skill set is, is such that he can do a lot of different things. He's got the versatility. The question is, what's the team going to ask him to do? And they didn't know that going in. So it's taken time for him to figure out his role. But as the season has progressed and as he's recovered from that injury and had more time to kind of blend in, 
I feel like he's gotten better and better and better and had a better understanding of exactly what the Lakers need from him in order to be successful. Yeah, Trevor. Well, that's all the time we have, but I really do appreciate you for coming on, sharing your Lakers knowledge, kind of sharing your history on there. But again, thank you for coming on, man. Oh, hey, no problem. Thank you. And uh, anytime, happy to do it. All right. If you like the Shot Clock Podcast, you can check us out on Instagram at the Shot Clock Pod or on Twitter at Pod the Shot Clock. Um, But yeah, thank you guys for checking this out. And we'll see you guys next Monday with a new episode.